Unless you're praying, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you're praying, then, well, we're going to get started anyway. Um, so let's go ahead and start with a prayer. We're going to do quick introductions, and then we're going to we're, we're going to get after it. So, Sammy, do you want to open us up with a prayer? Yeah, for sure. Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence in this room. We pray that you would just be upon us as we dive into what you have to say about relationships and, and sex and, more importantly, what identity has to do with those things um, and why you care about it and how we can walk alongside of our students as they struggle and, and figure it out. God, and I just pray that we would... Um, there would be a spirit renewed in us to empathize and understand um, what it is like to navigate that. Sometimes when we're removed from it and we're not in it, in it every day at high school or, or on the internet every day, seeing social media and struggling with comparison and, and all of those things, it's so easy for us to dissociate and just say, I don't understand why you don't get it. And I just pray that you would um, renew in us a, a willingness to go back to that place that we were at in middle and high school and, and just meet them where they're at, like you meet us where we are at. God, I pray um, that you, yeah, just be in this place, be um, in this workshop as we as we just figure it out. Um, and I thank you for... Um, allowing me to be a part of this and I just thank you for how you have used this message and this word to minister to me and I thank you for the youth leaders in this room that walk alongside of kids every day it is not easy and it is not effortless and I thank you for their sacrifice um, and I just pray that you would bless them as they continue to teach kids about you and your love um, and that, that you would equip them to do the things that, that you have called them to do for our students and for this generation um, that we believe has the power to shift the culture. Um, thank you for making us a part of this and for allowing us to, to be a part of your work. God, we love you. We praise you for what you are doing, what you have done, and what, what you're working on that we don't even know of. Uh, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and let's do quick introductions. And what I would like is um, name, and so like in 30 seconds, name why you're here and what's the worst sin you've ever committed. Um, I'm on. No holding yeah, back. I can do that. <laughs> and, um, and if, right, if you, if you go past the 30 seconds, we'll just right. cut you off and move here. to the next part. Yeah. <laughs> so you stole about that yeah. sin. It's all until you get to the sin. Okay, okay, then tell you what, we'll do the worst sin you've ever gotten caught for. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes it easier? It's better, yeah. Okay, okay, just kidding about this. I don't think it's better. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> Michael, would you be willing to start and just go around this way? Sure thing. Uh, Mike Johnson with uh, Believer's Church and Gospel for Asia here. Um, two, two reasons. One, my older sister and younger sister, part of uh, pregnancy crisis centers and just big advocates and stirred my heart in the Right to Life movement. And so I was like, oh, I want to go. That'd be interesting. And then I found out who's going to be here, and Stephen being one of them. Uh, youth is something I'm really impassioned. I want to be able to invest and disciple and uh, see others, and we have things for that. So really, no, I'm here to see Stephen. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally flew to D.C. Oh, dude, Stephen, so. you got an A. <laughs> Good work. Okay, now let's Looking see who can beat mine, okay? <laughs> uh, Vicki Hedelia, so we're two hats. I know. Director of a small uh, Anglican network in Canada church in Hamilton, Ontario. That's in Canada. <laughs> and uh, the other is I'm the national director of Anglicans for Life Canada. And so I'm here uh, at this particular one because I wanted to hear um, Sa what Sammy yeah. and you have been doing, but Sammy's been doing all this work and I've been hearing about it. So see, he's here. For me, I'm, and you're here for so him. I, that's my girl. Okay, there we go. So so name why you're here and Team Steven or Team Sandy. <laughs> That's not fair. More people know you. <laughs> we got your back, Sandy. Thank you. So Tom here, I'm, I serve this diocese as the canon for church planting. Uh, I'm here for the sex. I mean, I heard the sex. <laughs> Well, here's where it's here's where it's at. So that's why I'm here. Best answer. And I'm Team Sammy. I thought, man, yeah. hey, I was okay. really interested in, in the the fact that you have a curriculum. And when I when I heard that, I thought, oh, I want to really want to hear about that. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not in pastoral ministry now because of the job that I'm doing. 
but I have a lot of, I'm working with a lot of church planters and helping them to get things started. And so one of the real passions I have is seeing our youth discipled and, and, I, and I just feel like, you know, anything we can do to help offset the influence of our culture, we have to be able to do. So uh, that's, I'm very passionate about that and I want to pass that on to my planters. So. Well, Robbie Pruitt with Christ the King Anglican and Alexandria, Team Sandy. And yes, <laughs> yes, Robbie. <laughs> yes. You had maybe maybe this isn't such a good idea. <laughs> uh, Stephen and Sammy and I hung out in Nashville at the uh, Rooted Conference, and of course, we've been on the phone about what's happening tonight at mm -hmm. the Rise Summit, and just really excited about youth ministry. I've been in youth ministry since a high, I've been a high schooler. <laughs> and uh, that's been fun. So it's Jeff, been that's why you're my hero. 23 years. That's why you're my hero. Mm -hmm. Youth ministry lifers. That's the way to go. <laughs> so I've got a, a two children and, and one on the way. So I think I'll always be in youth ministry. <laughs> so I think the Lord will keep me there. So. Awesome. Um, I'm Esther Plaster. Uh, we, my husband and I, go to this parish. Um, we have four children, 15, 13, 12, and 10. Oh, boy. So you're in the middle of it. I'm in the middle of it. We go to public school. Mm. Um, and we just feel like that's where the Lord has us. And so we have a lot of conversations around the dinner table. No question is off limits. Um, I'm really excited about the youth group that we have here at the Falls Church. Um, if you haven't gotten to speak with those leaders, I'm going to make sure that happens because yes. it's really important and then get everybody networked and out of silos and what, what have you, but I'm just really excited about um, my children getting to be a part of this movement and um, they are movers and shakers for the kingdom. That's why the Lord brought my husband and I together. At the call in 2000, we were praying. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, we will talk wow. about that later, okay. but I mean, for such a time. Huh. That's right. So That's cool. cool. He's brought us here, so I'm super happy. And um, anything we can do to encourage y'all and get you connected or whatever. I don't know what the Lord has, but I'm, I'm seeing Aslan move around. So. Oh, very cool. So Team Steven or Team Sammy? I'm with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to take us Team on. S. Team S. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Danica. I live in the Chicago suburbs. And... Um, yeah, I'm mostly here because I um, do junior high ministry youth group um, stuff. Thank you. We had a break into small groups, and actually this year is like my favorite small group of girls I've ever had, and they're all just wonderful, and, um, which can't always be said. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> some years are harder than others. But um, yeah, I just love the idea of learning how to talk more with um, students about things. So it's been great. Awesome. So thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm Kara Beth, and I'm also from the Chicago suburbs, or from Wheaton. Um, nice. And, yeah, I'm not a youth in there, but I do work with college students. And, um, oh, that totally counts. Yeah. Totally counts. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and similar sure. things, but also trying to think about how to help our church, like, train ourselves, get trained up in yeah. uh, being able to speak about these things at different levels, so just wanted to hear about And so you guys are Church of the Res? No, actually, we go okay. to College Church. College Church, okay. Down the road. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so friends yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, just a second. Which team? Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make sense. Girl power. I think this is hurting me, so just so you guys know, the score is three to one in favor of Sammy right now. <laughs> I feel like let's keep that going. Good. Is it true equality? Is anyone like both colors? Yes. I'm Steve Wagner. I'm the director of Justice for All, which is a pro-life training organization based in Wichita, Kansas. I live out here in Northern Virginia, and we create. Uh, we have a training program for high school, college, and adult. Uh, Christians to learn how to talk about abortion and then uh, take that on to college campuses and try to find people who disagree with us so that we can learn to talk <laughs> I bet to that's them. That's hard. Wow. And so, yeah, it, it is hard, but um, we've found that there are ways that we can actually create dialogue um, that's really constructive and productive. So, because I create curriculum uh, through for that training program and we're also creating a curriculum for elementary school students. This seems 
to smack of curriculum, and I'm always interested in that. So mm -hmm. Very that's cool. why I'm here. It's like I want to make sure I get your stuff before. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, Sammy, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Or are you going to do that as part? Of I will do that as part. Of okay. Okay. Um, this is good. Like right, you can just like the, the reveal. So stick around so you can find out about Sammy. Okay. So, um, do we change our vote if we hear something? <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Okay. 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 Um, those of us in youth ministry, and I, I actually feel like I'm pretty qualified to talk about the longest time. Um, with the, the, the thing that we were always doing with kids when sex came up was don't. And trying to find ways to help kids think about it, and ways for kids to talk about it, and ways to understand that, that, that better for you and best for your future life is the stuff that the Bible says. And, and the main thing we were finding was hormones. I mean, bottom line. Um, that's all changed in a very short time. Um, I realized that it had changed a few years ago when I was doing a Bible study with a bunch of ninth grade boys. And it was a good Bible study. They were getting into the Bible. They were believing it. They were, you know, talking about the stuff that was going on in their lives. And, and so, you know, it's like it's, it's a, a, a good functioning discipleship group. And one of the moms in the church came up to me on, on Sunday and said, did you know that Tommy has just come out as gay on Facebook? There's no way. I talked to him on Tuesday. There's, you know, there's no way. So, solid Christian kid, solid Christian family, in a church where, you know, the right stuff is happening. And, you know, all of a sudden you got this guy deciding that he's gay. And, of course, when he comes out and says that he's gay, everything you get after that on Facebook is a good job, man. You know, the way to be cool nowadays mm -hmm. is to come out as gay or transgender. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's just, it's sort, of, it's sort of changed everything. It's, it's certainly not enough to say no anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to really be able to, to, to clearly show kids why God's way is better. You know, so it can't be no anymore. It has to say, oh my gosh, what you'd be giving up to do that is this amazing thing. And so what we're doing is trying to figure out how do we talk about this amazing thing. Mm -hmm. um, that is why I am so delighted that Sammy has done this. To, to me, Sammy is an answer to a prayer. I mean, basically, as the, as the denominational youth guy, I'm looking out at a denomination that made the decision to move out of the Episcopal Church because of the issue of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Right? When in 2003, the, the, the denomination elected an actively homosexual bishop. And it's like everybody goes... That this is just too far, right? Guess what we're not talking about anymore? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like all of our leadership are making assumptions that <laughs> because, you know, we're the people that moved out, we don't need to talk about it because everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. And they are absolutely unaware that our, our younger generations are being completely won away from biblical sexuality and therefore eventually away from the Lord mm -hmm. by what's going on in social media and popular media and schools and movies and all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I had been seeing this as a major problem and had been praying Lord God show us what to do. And, and God inspired Sammy to talk to Georgette and the rest is a miracle. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to Sammy and if you guys have any questions or want to change your vote, tell me. <laughs> all right, thank you, Stephen. Um, First, thank you guys for being here. Um, this is not an easy conversation to even begin to dive into because there are 500 bajillion different parts to it. Um, so the fact that you guys are here and want, want to invest in this is really cool. Um, I'll start by telling you guys a little bit about me. Um, this curriculum is not about me, but who I am definitely played a part and, and why I have a passion for teenagers and I love them um, and why I care about their relationships. So growing up, I when I was 15, you would have voted me least likely to um, ever hang out with teenagers um, for a living um, and definitely least likely to talk about Jesus with them. I was not a Christian. Um, when I was in high school, I met the Lord um, at a summer camp that I was invited to by with a friend. Um, didn't know it was a Christian camp, and I went there and met Jesus. And 
my life tra was transformed in that moment. Um, that same week, I also heard about the idea of abundance, and I had no idea that the Lord would inspire me to write this curriculum based on the idea of abundance. Um, but that's what I heard about that week, and I became obsessed with what does that mean? How do I get other people that abundance and a culture that that just tells you to do whatever you want and you'll figure it out, right? So I became obsessed with that and um, you can see some of my youth group students, they're my favorite, um, on the I lead youth group, but I'm a volunteer. Um, I lead youth group for middle school students and high school students. Um, and so I am in it with you guys in the in the fight of for their hearts and understanding how to how to do this. Um, and my fiance is a youth pastor, so we we kind of figure it out together. Um, but I have committed my life to this for the, the near future. Um, another thing you'll notice on the screen is there's a girl that looks kind of exactly like me. That's <laughs> my identical twin sister. Um, her name is Michelle. We call her Mish. Um, she's awesome. She's my best friend. But the, the cool thing about Mish and I was that when we were younger, we actually did not speak English until we were five years old. Um, so I had a disorder that was called cytophagia, and it happens in 2% of identical twins. Um, and we, we kind of went through this speech therapy um, until we were in high school. So the reason I bring that up um, is because that majorly affected my identity. Um, kids, you guys know that kids do not filter what they say um, to each other especially. So. Um, I was different than other kids, and that made me a target. Um, and the Lord protected me from so much, even though I didn't know him um, at that time. But looking back, I know that if I would have had a, a youth leader who invested in me and I would have had access to that, it would have drastically changed who I was um, as a teenager. So my heart behind this curriculum is identity. Um, and even even today, as a grown woman, I I have been told by people that um, I should silence my voice because it is different, um, and that you know that's an internal struggle with the me and the Lord. And but the cool thing is, when I met Jesus, He gave my story purpose, and He told me that He has shown me time and time again that I have been able to identify with kids who are different, and I would have no route to do that um, if, if he didn't make me unique and, and perfectly the way that, that he did. And um, my story is different than yours, but we all have things that make us different, right? And, and you felt the emotions that I'm probably trying to convey to you. Um, so it doesn't matter what the thing is. All of our kids have that thing that they feel like makes them different. So that's my, my heart. You'll notice when I when I dive into the curriculum, identity is woven throughout the whole thing. Um, and that I'll tell you a little bit about why I got to that place besides my own experience. But I'm going to tell you a few stories first that kind of highlight uh, why this is so important. Um, the first one, Tessa. Um, Tessa was a girl, she does the Agape Year program, if you've heard of that, part of the Anglican Church, for high school students who want kind of a gap year right after they graduate, right? So, yeah, great resource. Steven probably has information on that for sure. Um, she came to the Anglicans for Life office to learn more about missions and ministry, and we got to talking, and just, you know, she figured out the, this curriculum that I was writing, and wanted to learn more about it. So she asked me to get coffee. And in that conversation, I learned that she had struggled with being bisexual in high school. Um, and at the Preventional Assembly at uh, Wheaton, I believe it was, a few years ago, um, the Lord set her free from that. And she is now following Jesus. Um, yep, and her mom will be here tonight, actually. She's bringing youth groups to me. So her mom is a priest. She grew up in youth group, um, was part of the drama club in middle school, and just like Stephen was talking about in his introduction, um, she wanted somewhere to fit in. 
and she figured out that if she identified as being bisexual, she could fit in somewhere. She wouldn't have to figure it out anymore, and she wouldn't have to wrestle with where she fit into the world. So she identified as bisexual, um, and, and the Lord has been faithful in that, and that was really, really cool um, to see. So hearing her story has been really cool and, and connecting that with stories of my students. Um, I had a girl named um, Maddie who came to our youth group um, and our youth group is different than most. It's a, a lot of the kids don't go to our church. Um, they're, they, they come as a social thing, right? They, they, it's kind of young life-ish so they come hang out with their friends and Maddie came in and introduced herself as Matt. Um, and, and she has been with us now for two years. Um, she is a, with a foster family, so that also plays into her story. Um, and she has since um, been released from that, and she is now identifying again as Maddie. Um, and yeah, and so that has been really cool. But, but the key to that transformation in the past two years has been constant conversations about identity and who she is and who the Lord made her. Um, so that just, again, confirmation that identity is where we need to start with this. Um, more teens than ever, a, sp a fun statistic, are, are identifying um, with having same-sex attraction issues. Um, there are now just not bisexual and homosexual, but uh, there are things like pansexuality, right? When you are attracted to all genders, um, whoever whoever you want, right? Um, there is asexuality where you are attracted to nothing and, and you don't feel attraction to anything, right? So gender fluidity is on the rise. And 63% of people in the United States say that that is their content with where our culture is on that. Um, and they are content with the fact that the, the suicide rate increases exponentially after the age of 26 for people that have made transgender decisions before the age of 26, which is when your brain really fully develops, right? And they hit that age, and when their brain is fully developed, the suicide rate actually increases um, to, to three times the rate of a, of a straight person. So, so that statistic to me, uh, suicide is connected to this 100%. Um, Tracy um, is a, a fellow youth leader in Georgia, and she told me, um, met her in Nashville when we were there for Rooted, um, and she told me the story of her 10-year-old daughter. Um, she was having conversations with her daughter about sex from very early on, um, and I have a reference that I will give to you guys from Harvest USA if you don't know who they are. They put out a ton of resources for parents. So. They have a sheet that talks about when to say it and what to say when you do have to talk to your kids about sex, right? So she had started these conversations very early on, and her daughter was watching a YouTube video about makeup. She wanted to learn how to put mascara on, um, and in the middle of her YouTube video, a pornographic scene appeared. Um, a YouTube video that the mom had uh, approved her daughter watching and luckily because she had initiated conversations her daughter ran to her and said mom this is what I just saw what, do I, what does that mean if that conversation wouldn't have been initiated who knows where that little girl would be right so again very eye opening um, if you guys have not heard of this book so this book is called Sex, Jesus, and Conversations, The Church Forgotten, um, and it is written by Mo Isom, and she um, used to be a, a, she almost went pro for soccer, um, was on the Olympic team, and then she got hurt, um, and now she goes to Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and she travels and speaks about her experience with identity and sex, and this book is really, really good at highlights um, how we as the church have missed a lot of marks when it comes to teaching sex. And, and the point that she makes that inspired me um, was that her parents assumed that the church was talking to her about sex. And the church assumed that her parents were talking, and the vice versa, right? 
So she never actually got the wider concept of purity that you're, you're supposed to get and why that's important. And my experience, I, my, my parent, my mom is a Christian, my dad is not. Um, and I remember in third grade, my mom sat me down. I was in third grade, and my mom was like, I was sitting at the kitchen table, and you never forget the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you never forget. And I was, like, mortified. And, and my mom was like, yeah, so let's have this conversation. So I'm, like, gearing up for a big, you know, I'm like, oh, this is going to be the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And she just said, yeah, just don't have sex till you get married. And I was like, okay, all right, conversation done. And that is all I heard for the rest of my teenage years. So she makes that plan, goes into more depth about why parents need to be involved and the church needs to be involved. And it's a partnership between the two and it isn't just one. So great resource that I commend to you guys. Uh, part of what I also do in Pittsburgh uh, where I live is I work for a pregnancy center and I go into high schools and teach sex ed from a secular perspective. So without the Bible, um, really cool. This is a great book. It's called Hooked and it goes into how it's the science of how sex affects our students' brains. Um, there are, there are just a ton of statistics about porn in here. Um, the hookup culture is in here. So if you're looking for a resource hooked, um, it's really, really good. It's on Amazon. If you look it up, it's really popular. So it will be the first one that comes up. Um, but yeah, so I go into schools and the one thing that I had heard this before right, with a speaker and he basically said that kids view sex as a biological response. They just are, they're, they're used to, they're, they're like, that's what my body does. Like, I get hungry, I eat, I am thirsty, I drink, I am horny, I want to have sex, so that's what I'm going to do. And I was like, mm, that's bold. I, I don't know if that's what kids actually think. And a year and a half ago when I started going into high schools, um, kids have no filter in a public high school. Like you, they will talk about sex all day long <laughs> with you. Sometimes when I go into youth groups, they just stare at you and like fear, you know? And But public high schools, like they are super honest. And in 11th grade, classroom I was in the boy said those exact words to me and he said yeah I'm, I'm horny so I masturbate there's nothing wrong with that and if I find out if I like a girl if I don't like her if I want to have sex with her that's just what I do so that is the cult that's the culture in, in a nutshell um that they're growing up in so there's a gap right between what we need to be teaching kids and what they are in and that's what this curriculum abundant life you were made for more seeks to do um so i'm gonna start by taking a look at the the culture um that we are in um and i think I think that this will give you guys a good picture and then we're going to shift gears and talk about what the church has taught and then we're going to talk about what the Bible says about sex and how the church and the Bible sometimes don't match up on what we teach. So this is a statistic that 82% of teens um, will say that they have wanted at some point one sexual partner in their life and only 3% of us make it to that point. That is... That, that gap is huge. That is a huge gap. Um, so again, just just a just a, another reason why this is so important. So culture, um, love in our culture, we use it so loosely, right? I say, oh, I love that girl's haircut. I love Starbucks, which I do spend way too much money there. But I love food. I love chipotle i love my parents i love my twin sister i love puppies are all of those type of types of love equal yet we use the same word for them so our our students don't know the, the difference if we're not teaching them in and that's why the bible is such a good piece um to have and and this is just a fun fact today um you will see this on google if you google sex education today 
you'll see a Netflix series come up. Netflix released a series on January 11th. It is a British series, and it teaches kids about sex. Um, the topics of pornography, exploitation, um, abortion are all in that show and made to be normal. And that is on Netflix. You know, my youth group students all have Netflix, and it is the number one trending show on Netflix right now. It's called Sex Education. So, yeah, just be, be aware of that. Um, they, that is a part of them redefining love because we now equate love with sex. Um, the hookup culture is a huge part in that. And if you've read The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller, he gets into this a little bit. And, and he said that the New York Times Magazine did a report on how teenagers view relationships, and they viewed it, rightly so, to be very hard work, right? Relationships are not an easy thing. Um, and, and that turned them off. So they didn't like that. So as a result, the hookup culture has been formed. And he goes into what that means, that, that it means a simple sexual encounter in a relationship at the end of that sexual encounter is not in any way expected or needed. Um, that, that's what they are, that's what they're into. And Donna Frieda's um, is another innovator on this relationship topic. And she studies college students, actually. She has a TED Talk, if you Google, she is not a Christian. Um, but uh, she has really, really good studies on the hookup culture. And she studies the fact that these same college students, these same teenagers that invented the hookup culture admit and studies that it has left them broken and unhappy, but they're in it, so they don't know what to do. So she does a TED Talk on that. It's awesome. Um, her last name? It is F-R-E-I-T-A-S. And she also says that they want a long-term monogamous relationship, but that seems way far off. So they just want to want the sex now, and that's how they fill the void. What was her first name again? I'm sorry. Donna. Donna. Yep. Um. Okay. So. So I taught. I referenced this book, Hooked. Um, and that book is also really good because it goes into um, studies about marriage that have done that show that the most successful marriages um, are, are completed and the happiest when you wait until you are married to have sex. And there have been studies released for years that say that teenagers are um, disengaged with the idea of marriage and they don't like it. And that that is untrue. They, they, if you don't know who Ben Stewart is, he Ben Stewart is um, he used to work for Breakaway Ministries in Texas, um, and he is now pastoring a church here in Washington D.C. Oh, yeah. Passion. The passion. Yep. Yep. Church. Yeah. He um does a lot of studies on this stuff, and he actually asked the question. Someone was talking earlier uh, earlier about language and how the way you ask a question matters with people's responses. Mm -hmm. So he asked a question. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you do you, I forget how he worded it, but. The question that came back, he said, do you wish to be married? And they, it was somewhere between like 63% and 65% said yes. So that left 40% of kids being like, no, I don't want that. And he was like, that can't be right. So he <laughs> went back, yeah. rephrased the question. Um, and I think he said, how many of you would like to be with one person for the rest of your life who is committed to you? <laughs> And 92% of teenagers said yes. So the word marriage is, is just slaughtered by the divorce culture and, and the rates of that in America. So Hulk goes into the science of how casual sex and the hookup culture are affecting our, our students' brains. Um, and how it literally rewires the, the connectivity in their brains. Um, and when I go in to schools and teach from a secular perspective, we start out with this talk, and it's called My Whole Self. 
and like I've done it in youth groups for an identity talk, and it's basically the the book gets into this, but kids literally believe that they are just physical beings. That's what the culture tells. That's what they learn in school. That's what they learn in health class. Um, until they are, they get some sort of psychology class, maybe in high school. Um, but statistics show that they believe they are just the physical part of themselves. So we have kids uh, talk about in their the intellectual part of themselves. What do you enjoy learning about? You know, um, the emotional part of themselves. How do you deal with conflict? Uh, the social part, are you extroverted or introverted? How do you gain energy? Uh, the spiritual part in the schools we describe as being how do you view yourself in comparison to the world? Uh, and they fill out, they fill out and then they share. And it's, it's mind blowing to see that we really have equated sex with just being a physical thing. And that's not what the Bible says. So, so. Kids are learning that in school where they spend seven and a half hours a day. So how do we shift that? Mm -hmm. So this is another statistic that was done by the National Center to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. Uh, they found that 70% of females in high school that had had sex and 50% of males in high school that have had sex reported that they would have wished that they would have waited. Mm -hmm. So the slide I'm going to put up next is about pornography. There's a lot of stats on here. I can send this um, and post this somewhere for you guys for sure. But most of this, these statistics is from an organization called Fight the New Drug. Great organization. Um, again, not Christian, but they believe that porn does rewire your brain and affects your relationships and affects the world. And they go at it from those three categories. Um, just some, just a few of these on here, like Steven pointed out before, one in three porn viewers are women. It is not just a guy problem. Um, porn sites receive more traffic than Netflix, Amazon, Twitter, and Twitter combined each month. Porn is a $57 billion industry. It is connected to sex trafficking. It is connected to exploitation of men and women. And a pastor in Cincinnati, Ohio, pulled all of his seventh graders who are 11 years old, and 100% of them said that they had been exposed to porn. And that story about that YouTube video I told before is that's how they do it. it, it they all have these, right? It's easier than ever to come up on that stuff. Um, and 50% of Christian men are addicted to pornography. So it is not just an outside of the church issue. The average age a child is exposed to porn is 11, but the, the, the newest studies are showing that that number has actually dropped to age eight. So the culture overall sends these three messages. Sex is casual, it's primarily physical, and it's essential to who you are. Cohabitation is a definite and positive step towards marriage, um, no matter how old you are, right? That's seen as to be normal. Divorce rates are at an all-time high, and suicide rates increased 70% between 2006 and 2016 in teens. So that's the culture we're in. The church has been teaching this. This is from the Colton Center. They did a web series on sex and the church back in August. Highly recommend if you visit their website, it will be there that you can gain access to that. Uh, but they pulled interviewees and they said that the, the most basic narrative they got was just like I got from my parents. Don't have sex before you get married. So when I talk to youth groups about this, the, I, I get three categories of kids. Well, the first category is that I don't know what I think about sex. The second category is I don't care. This is weird. Why are we talking about it? Right. And the third category is just don't have sex before you get married. But not one kid that I have talked to has been able to tell me why. 
that why that's a thing why should i not have sex before i get married so generation z which is the generation you are working with um huh thank you is is has reported that they don't like relationships because porn is safer to them and it requires no work and no effort and they can get it whenever they want it 70 percent of students will have their first sexual experience by the age of 19. So the worst thing we can do is to water down the issue of sex and not talk about it at all. So what I'm going to go into next is to talk about what God thinks about sex and what the Bible says about sex. And you can see kind of where we have missed the mark on this teaching. So the first thing, um, this is just, I'm sure you guys all know what the Bible says about sex um, as adults, but this is just kind of a run through of it. First, sex is deeper than our physical bodies. Sex in the Bible is holy, and, and the Hebrew word used for it in Genesis is ikad, and it, it describes a, a fusing together, right, of all parts of you, not just the physical part of you. Second, sex is a window into a larger story. And, and we see in creation, before the fall, sex was part of the created order. It was normal and it was very good, engaged in freely without guilt or shame or abuse. And after the fall, it was worked into something entirely different, right? We see the first two men mentioned in na uh, um, by name in the Bible after Adam and Eve and after the fall happened were their kids, Cain and Abel right and what happened in that story one of them killed the other one wait what so i know plot twist so exploitation to get what you want appears the next two women named in the bible by name are both appropriated by one man we see the misuse of women come into play after the fall Third, sex is intrinsically good and it's a gift for unifying two people in marriage. And sex is not what makes you truly human. And this is the point that our that our I believe the church is missing. Um, so many people today define themselves by their sexuality. Kids don't say I I I'm struggling with same sex attraction. They say I am gay. I am bisexual. That's identity. That has become part of who they are identifying as. And, and who you are is not who you are attracted to. That, that's not who you are, bottom line. So the Bible doesn't have that view either. The Bible says that a person is a human because they were created in the image of the creator, right? It says nothing about you're a human because of who you're attracted to, but that's what our culture is feeding them. And and just a point to make that, that sex is, is natural for human beings, but it isn't necessary. Jesus didn't have it, Paul didn't have it, many others have not had sex. So the fact, the fact that culture is feeding them that it's essential to their being is not true, according to the Bible. Another truth we need to be telling kids is that sex is good, but it isn't ultimate. It isn't, it isn't, your life does not start when you get married, right? That, that's not the ultimate thing. Marriage is good, sex is good, but also singleness and celibacy are good. So having that conversation with them. The other challenge is that nationally Planned Parenthood is the largest sex education provider within the school districts. The nation's largest abortion provider is going into schools and teaching them how to have safe, healthy sex and to not have any consequences for it. I actually met with a friend of a friend last year who uh, works in the Planned Parenthood sex education department back in Pittsburgh. And I learned three things from that conversation. One, they tell teenagers that they are old enough to make decisions by themselves. That, that scientifically and, and physically they are not old enough to make. They take parents out of the equation. So they're, they're, they're neglecting that parents have the ultimate authority over their children. 
this this picture up here that's an ad that Planned Parenthood use, uses to kids on their teen resource page on their website second the LGBTQ initiative is pushed in the classroom in an effort to normalize it so when they have examples of, of in their sex ed presentations they will use same-sex or transgender or pansexual couples and that's what the gay rights movement did in the 1960s and it has worked they, they if you read um it, it's a it's a thick book it's like as thick as the harry potter series books are uh, but it's all about the gay rights initiative in the 60s and the founder of that wrote it um, and, and he read in it that his core goal was to normalize gay, uh, being gay, and, and it has worked, and that's what Planned Parenthood is doing with teens. They mention abstinence as an option, but they say it's not really relevant, so they don't focus on it. Kids want to have sex, so that's what they're going to help them do. So our kids... Are, are really struggling with how sexuality, romance, and love fit together. And, and they're playing like a game of Jenga. That's what I think about it as. Like they're pulling off pieces of themselves in an effort to figure it out. And eventually it's going to fall, fall over. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, in every way. And I'm not saying that this is a simple shift, but, but we have to begin the conversation about how to empathize and understand and listen within the church and kind of get in this with them. So I believe that sexual understanding is a heart transformation and not a behavior modification. That's what I believe, and that's what Abundant Life, You Were Made For More, is all about. I think that our sexual sin is a result of a misunderstanding of who God is, who we were created to be, and who we are today as, as humans, and why he calls us to a sacrifice of waiting until we are married to have sex. So... I'm going to go into this at the Y Summit tonight a little bit uh, when I talk about identity, but there's these two things in the Bible called imperatives and indicatives, and basically, it, it, I'm going to talk about the, the, I had never heard about this, and this is something the Lord put on my heart, but an indicative is the truth. It's something that the Bible states about you that is true, and an imperative is a, is a command, so those are the two types of statements in the Bible. And if you look scripturally, I'm going to give you guys an example um, on the next, the next the slide after this. The truths of the gospel support and sustain the commands of the gospel. If you find a command in the Bible, I challenge you to go home and do this. Look a few lines ahead of it and you will find a statement about identity, about who you are. And that is something no one told me, even all through college. I never got that. And, and it's, it's true. So we're going to take it for a, for a little test drive. I have one example. Um, the, it says you will flee from sexual immorality. That is true. But a few lines before that, you're told that your, bo your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So why are we not focusing on that line? And why do we just tell kids to flee from sexual immorality? Right? So another good example of this is in the, uh, the Old Testament. And right before the Ten Commandments, it starts out with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. God is telling us in that statement that we're his children, right? And we skip over that. We're just like, oh, yeah, thanks, God. He brought us out of Egypt, right? He, he's speaking to your identity to tell you that you are his child, and that's why you should not do those ten things, so that is, that is what this initiative is, is built off of. So Abundant Life hits on three main points. This is the vision of the curriculum. Um, and I'm going to hand these, got, these out to you guys. It's gospel-centered. So every teaching in the curriculum will teach the gospel. The kids will hear about Jesus no matter what topic you are talking about them. 
I'm talking like about to them. Um, but teaching is relevant. So you'll see, um, I'm going to throw up a slide of what the teachings are all about. It, it gets into some heavy topics. And then second, it really hits on, third, it really hits on uh, partnership with youth leaders and parents. So we want to bring them both into the culture. I did an informal survey at the time I was throwing these things around and 10% of kids, um, I surveyed 100 kids and 10% of them said that they got the most effective narrative about sex from the church and about 70% of them said they wanted to hear more about it. So your kids want to hear about this stuff. Um, it's important to them and they're in it. So. If you visit our website, which is youwermadeformore.org, you'll see that our three pillars are engaging teens, partnering with parents, and equipping volunteers. Um, visit that website and you'll see we have resource pages for teens and youth leaders and parents. There's a blog um, in 2019. We're hoping to start a podcast about parents who are, or who are in this with their kids, um, who have had kids who have struggled with gender identity and fluidity. Um, Tessa, I'm hoping to get her on, that, that, that young woman who had been freed from her struggle with bisexuality. Um, so people like that will be on that podcast. And the, the next slide is going to be an overview of the curriculum. And if you visit the AFL resource table downstairs and there are um, handouts of this and it's also on the website. So everything with this curriculum is web based um, because we know that's how teens engage and it honestly get, allows us to get it to you for cheaper um, than we would if it was printed. Um, so the first module is about identity. Um, it's called Rooted. It goes into the first teaching is about identity. The second one goes into the definition of love and how it is different than the definition of infatuation. Third is God, guys, and girls. And there you're going to get a conversation about gender identity and what it means to be a man and a woman and how um, it, it really speaks. I, I had it reviewed by several of my friends who are either gay or have struggled with sexual identity um, and they have approved it. <laughs> so that was really encouraging um, to see that it ministered to them. Um, and then third, the second module was about social media, pornography, and suicide. So it gets into those heavy topics that really no one wants to talk about. Um, and so that has been really cool. The third module is all about dating. Uh, what what God thinks about you if you have messed up before. Um, it was such an important conversation. And uh, redefining the meaning of marriage is the third teaching in there. The fourth teaching is bring all of those things together. So the fourth module goes into why following Jesus is worth it. It talks about the indicatives versus imperatives and, and why that really is important to understand. And then um, once we understand what relationships are, how does that shift how we act on a daily basis? So that is an overview of the curriculum. And this is a screenshot of our website that you can see. So you can see all of the tabs. Um, it is, if you purchase it, it's, it's $50 for the 12 teachings. And with that, you get um, all 12 teachings in a Word document. You get marketing graphics um, that have been pre-created or I can edit them for you on the template and send them to you. You also, if, if you know a volunteer youth leader, because as I have been made aware, the ACNA does not have a lot of hire youth staff, right? So we, we really wanted to meet volunteers. I am a volunteer, so I understand there is not a lot of time to do all of all of the teaching prep and all of that. Um, so there are videos that we were professionally filmed in a studio of, of me teaching <coughs> the teaching. So you could just pull that up and show it. And there's, so there's a large group teaching and small group discussion questions for your youth leaders to have at the end of each teaching. So that is, is a snapshot. Um, in 2019, there's going to be a fifth module coming out that 
focuses more on the transgender epidemic and how to minister to students. Um, it is mentioned throughout every teaching. Every teaching has a gender identity component, but we really realized that you, we had to have a, have a whole one on that. That's what youth leaders were requesting from me. Um, and then there will be one about trauma and abuse in there. And then the third one is to be determined. So if you guys have ideas or if you get things within the next few months and you start hearing things your students would, would want to hear about, let me know. Shoot me an email. My business card is up here and my email is on there. Um, so I, would, I, I really, my prayer for this is to partner with you guys and teaching your kids about it. Um, and like I said, I'm in it with you. Like I'm not an expert in any way, but... Um, I, I want to be in it with you and figure out how we shift this um, narrative in our in our culture and church. So if you have questions, I went a little bit over. Um, this is our social media page, um, and then our email. Like I said, it's on the business card up here. Um, I'll be here all day though, so come and come and talk to me. Um, and then there's some resources up here. I mentioned this paper, what to say and when to say it. So if you want to have this as a resource for parents, um, it basically just talks about when you should start having conversations with your kids about sex, um, and, and they will fight you on this because they don't want to have it. Um, until their kids are about 11 or 12. This recommends you start at age 2, teaching them about what their body parts are. So great resource. There are two resources up here about how to talk to middle schoolers and high schools about pornography. So take those on your way out, and I'll be here if you guys have questions and stuff like that. The website says... The models are sold out. What does that mean? That is okay. That is because we have we are switching it on Monday okay. to be officially. This is our debut of the curriculum. Right. So on Monday they should be switched to be. Okay. You can get them. Yeah. Is, is there a way that like students like for instance I have predominantly junior and high girls. Yeah. And is there a way that you can give? like your girls Bible study a access to this where they in the comfort of their home can yeah, so, watch these videos yeah when you, you when you purchase them you'll get a link to a Vimeo account mm -hmm. with a password on it and so I, if you I can send them purchase the, it and yep. distribute that to my youth group yep. so yep. I'm your first customer on Monday <laughs> that'd be great yeah alright um, and so, okay, you